Institute for Faith and Freedom at Grove City College presents Liberty Mail with the Student Fellows of Faith and Freedom. Welcome back to Liberty Mail. I'm Katie Kenline. And I'm Grace Riley. And we're coming to you from the underground studio at Grove City College for the Institute for Faith and Freedom. Today we're talking about um, a hearing that was held yesterday on Capitol Hill. By the time you're reading or you're listening to this, it'll be at the beginning of the week, talking about the importance of protecting female athletics and Title IX. Um, and Grace, you have an interesting experience. Again, both of us coming from um, more left states, blue states, you have an interesting experience in Connecticut that was at the beginning of when we first started hearing about women's sports and the impact of transgender athletes competing in women's sports. Can you tell us about your experience? Yeah, this is just a kind of a fun thing, I guess. Maybe it's not, not fun. fun. <laughs> well, yeah, it's not fun. But looking back at where we are now and what's happened since the hearing that happened yesterday, when I was in high school, I was an athlete. I did track and field and cross country. So I was a distance runner. And I was actually at the state championships in Connecticut for track and field where this stuff really started picking up nationally. So there were two transgender athletes who were competing at this state championship in Connecticut. They were sprinters. And this was at the beginning of when this stuff all started happening uh, before Leah Thomas, before Riley Gaines, before the more common figures you know today um, as far as athletics goes in this issue. But back a few years ago, there were two athletes. One of them was Andrea Yearwood. The other one I can't remember the name right now. But they were both biological males who were identifying as females. And, of course, as you would expect, at this meet, both of them took top spots that would advance them on to the state opens championship. So to the next level of the championship. So what that meant was that two biological women didn't get those spots mm -hmm. to advance. And the way that it works for track at least is you work on your time and you work to qualify for the state championships. If you get the time that you're supposed to have, you get to go to the States. And then from there, it's the top spots that will get you on to the next level. And then you go onward competing and competing until um, the end there, going bigger and bigger. So what that meant was for two female athletes, they were unable to advance to the next level. Now, this actually does have real implications because that means losing scholarship mm -hmm. potential you, losing the opportunity to compete further, to be seen by these scouts. There's a lot of different things that came into play, and there were Connecticut athletes who did speak out against this at the time um, and who continued to. Um, so people were speaking out against it, but it was so interesting to remember being there when this all took place. I remember seeing national reporters, Breitbart was there, all sorts of things. Uh, which was really kind of surreal. And even the other funny part of this is I did see one of them in the bathroom. I obviously didn't go up, but one of them was in the bathroom, so the, one of the transgender athletes. So it really, it, it was very real being there for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think when we started to see this, like maybe 2015, 2016, uh, you know, so much has changed in the last even five years to the point where now we're seeing this all over the place and we end up seeing a story that I'm sure all of you know where Riley Gaines swims against Leah Thomas in the national championship. They, you know, honestly, I and Riley Gaines has told her her testimony and this whole story, and it seems like a very God-ordained moment of, like, it is so, it's so impossible for them both to score and or to, I'm sorry, to tie. They, Leah Thomas, transgender, biologically male swimmer who had swam on the male swimming team um, at um, Penn State, swims against um, Riley Gaines, all-American, incredible swimmer from Kentucky. They tie down to, like, the very, very smallest fraction of a second. Um, and what does the NCAA do? They give the trophy, the spot, the spot on the podium, to Leah Thomas um, and Riley Gaines, biological woman who's worked her whole life um, and worked so hard to get there. Um, somehow, one, this biological male has tied with her um, and she's forced to stand offside the podium, not have a trophy. Um, that's where we start to see because there's a very, very clear image of wow, this is becoming more and more real. This is at the highest level of female sports and there are males winning 
female championships. And it's all over the place, all over the place. Um, and, you know, can be seen in all sports now at all levels. And obviously that's why this hearing was held, because mm -hmm. now there are a lot of states who are going back and forth on what the answer should be here, because the biological realities are clear and undebatable. They're blatant. Mm -hmm. um, and no matter how much some may try to debate them and say, oh, no, it's all subjective and this and that and, oh, equality, this, that. No matter how much people try to push that, it does not change the scientific biological differences. Mm -hmm. It does not change the fact that, of course, the biological males have a biological advantage over women mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. they're competing in these sports. And there, there's evidence of that. There are biological men beating mm -hmm. women, okay, like winning these races, being in these positions. So, of course, it's not only uh, the reality, it's actually being proven. So the point's being proven naturally here. Mm -hmm. Well, and when transgender athletes, so when biological males start to perform and do athletics with biological women, the men are always doing better. All of these transgender athletes are doing very well in female athletics. It's mm -hmm. undeniable that they're taking over a space that was created specifically for women. So we both, I played NCAA volleyball here at Grove City College. We both were high school varsity athletes, you know, played at, all, well, I, I ran also and then played volleyball, but we've both done athletics and we know, especially it's interesting we mentioned running um, because there are some very, so, you look at statistics and it's undeniable the differences between men and women. So um, actually one of my favorite athletes at the um, a track athlete, Allison Felix, um, she holds the world, um, the world championship medals record. She has the most, she has a ton of Olympic medals and world championship medals. She has the most um, track medals for a, a female athlete in history. Um, she, for the 400 meter dash, um, I don't have her specific time here, but um, in 2018 alone, she's world champion. 275 high school boys ran faster times than the world champion female runner in the same event. Um, you look at statistics like that, and it's undeniable um, that there are biological differences. And we have to have a space where we can do athletics um, and just compete against other biological women. Allison Felix had a space where she was able to excel and not have to run against biological males. And part of this, all of this um, is accumulating and we start to see all of the um, transgender athletes, um, this is all picked up, ironically, right at the 50 year anniversary of Title IX, which gave us a space where we could play sports and have the ability um, to be protected in that. So. An interesting thing is only one in 27 girls participated in school sports before Title IX. It's undeniable now we can see that since its enactment, two in five girls now participate in school sports. We don't want that number to go down. Sports and athletics are incredibly empowering and help us become better leaders and stronger um, and able to like work on a team. Um, and it's not, it's not going to be the case if we're getting crushed down by male athletes who've entered our arena to play women's mm -hmm. sports. So um, the interesting thing is yesterday there's a hearing on Capitol Hill because the Biden administration, um, they're seeking to redefine sex discrimination in Title IX. And instead of saying Title IX provided a space for female athletes to be able to play sports. And now it's going to be on the basis of gender identity if you identify as a female. And so we start to see problems. problematic. Yep. Yeah, incredibly problematic. And one other interesting thing, so we'll build more on that and the state of everything now, but one interesting thing, I did a story for the American Spectator, which you can find at spectator.org, about this topic uh, where there was a study, it was done by Gallup, that found that 70% of Americans say that they oppose transgender athletes in women's sports. So at least from that poll, there are a lot of Americans who oppose this um, and understand the biological differences that there are and how that comes into play with athletics. Because we can obviously have the conversation um, that is the same but different about transgenderism in general. But in the athletic space, I mean, this is about 
physical competition. So it, it really does come down to these biological realities, mm-hmm. and it should be clear. And our conversation hasn't even gotten into uh, the problems, other problems that come alongside this. For example, Riley Gaines, she shared her testimony of the locker room, of mm-hmm. um, being exposed to male genitalia in the locker room because of this. So there, there's other levels like that, too, where women's spaces uh, that are supposed to be private spaces like that, like locker rooms, the effect that this then has on that. So there's yeah. a lot of levels to this. Mm-hmm. And the answer is really clear to me. I, I can't even believe that this is a debate because it just seems so ridiculous to me, to be honest. I mean, I just think that the differences are so clear and I don't understand why this is confusing. Yeah. So what we're saying, too, is not just our um, males taking over women's athletics and women's spaces, taking the positions on teams, taking positions for scholarships, beating women. But it's also um, about women are ath- like young women as athletes, their well-being, their protection. We are seeing people getting hurt. Um, people. I just read an article about um, a bunch of female wrestlers just walking out of a tournament because um, there were trans athletes there um, who, and they felt incredibly unsafe by that. Um, so we start to see people's well-being both emotionally and and physically really at risk. There are tons that you, you can look up. It continues, unfortunately, to occur of women getting injured in volleyball games, um, getting hit in the face of the ball by like a crazy, strong, not biological female athlete, a male. Yeah, um, that, and that was, was it wrestling or, or boxing or something? There was this too, crazy yep. video um, where if you've seen it or not, it doesn't, we can describe it here. But there was this crazy video of a girl who competed against a biological male. I think it may have been boxing. Uh, and her face so. is just like, she has blood everywhere, bruises. She's completely beat up like beyond even recognition like she's clearly not okay in this video uh really really bad shape uh from this match and they asked her about how what it was like competing against the trans athlete and she's trying to say oh it was good this that but then you see like she's completely beat up uh and it's just crazy the stories uh, like that across the country um yeah. and well, yeah this is the problem is that we know, I would, I would challenge, like we can ask every young female athlete and say, would you like to compete against a biological male? Um, that's a question that I think all these advocates on the other side should start thinking, would they like to run against a biological male? Would they like to swim against a biological male? Would they like to wrestle or box with? But then we see the problem is, is that these athletes and young women are told they're not protected by the NCAA. You know, I'm sure this girl was told this is this is what it is now like this is who you have to fight that this is just the reality there no one is protecting the young women who have to enter these arenas um and so unfortunately ncaa olympics now the biden administration wants to redefine everything it's really unfortunate and i want to go back to before we were kind of talking about and i even made the comment of I don't understand why this is even a debate. Well, the reason, why why does the Biden administration want to change those terms? Why do people uh, think that it's a good idea to have transgender athletes competing against women? Well, because if if they acknowledge that there are biological differences, then their entire position falls Mm -hmm. apart because their position is denying What's true, their, their position is denying the biological differences, denying that there even are genders, um, and it falls apart if they don't kind of go all the way with it. Because it's, you know, you've let some things slide and you've they've taken the position of, oh, gender doesn't matter, mm-hmm. it's a construct, there's no such thing as biological uh sex anymore really because it should be assigned and this and also all the things that we've been seeing all the crazy things piling up and getting worse and worse it's like now it's really hard for them to backpedal yeah uh because then they're conceding those points now that i that's really the reason because you you can't say all the things they've been saying and then come and agree that oh yeah there are all these differences Mm -hmm. all these 
facts are true. That's why, obviously, they're in a really tough position right now. Mm -hmm. Um, And unfortunately, they've chosen to go full speed ahead with it. And the Biden administration has chosen to go ahead with pushing this. And there are a number of states. uh, So at the time that I had done that story, it was 27 um, who in public schools allowed uh, the transgender athletes to compete. Mm -hmm. It may be more than that now. But the point being, I mean, the response has been to go full speed ahead with this, no matter what, no matter the consequences, even though it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's part of why we saw um, on Capitol Hill, the Subcommittee on Health Care and Financial Services, um, Congresswoman McLean um, from Michigan, she held a hearing about protecting female athletics in Title IX, um, had some really great guests there to talk about their experiences. Um, and so, but the problem was, is unfortunately, testimonies, like the true lived experiences of world-class, the best female college athletes in the United States um, for swimming, um, including Riley, Riley Gaines, was there. Um, and some her testimony, her experience was met with some really extreme criticism from some of the, I would say, far left Congress um, people who were there, Congress members, especially a a certain congresswoman who started calling her bigoted. And um, this is her testament here experience, which is really fascinating because um, the congresswoman's not the one who had to race against um, a transgender athlete. So, um, there's a lot of interesting quotes from this. Yeah, you can read her quote. She had this is the quote that kind of says it all. Go ahead, Katie. Yeah. So basically, this congresswoman attacks her for being transphobic, um, and Riley Gaines says, "Well, if my testimony makes me transphobic, then I believe your opening monologue makes you a misogynist." Because at the beginning, um, she, you know, there's just all this like use of words that it's interesting when we say, "Oh, we're like." Pro women, um, but and that includes trans women. Well, we're really when it boils down to it, then you're not pro these female yeah. athletes. All, all that needs to happen is a Matt Walsh to walk into the room and ask, "What is a woman?" Oh, that's yeah. all that was needed there. Because I'm sure, like as you're describing from the opening statements, there they're pro women, pro trans women. Well. What does that mean? Because, at, yes, you're not pro-biological woman, which is yeah. woman. You're not um, if you're taking those positions, clearly. So, uh, obviously, that's the core of this, that no one can define that or wants to. Everyone can define that. It's not difficult at all. But uh, a large percentage of people don't want to define that, which uh, is just ridiculous. So. Yeah. Well, and for... Uh you know, for a political group that's told so many people for years, you have to believe everything that comes out of a woman's mouth, then to stand there and tell them, oh, this is not your experience. This is not actually what happened to you, which we saw also um, with Paula S- uh, Scallon, who swam on the same team as Leah Thomas was in the locker room. Um, you can watch. Uh, there are a lot of interviews with her now that have come out. She's very brave to come out and talk about her experience um, and talks about trying to be silenced by the university and her team and just told, like, this is what you have to go along with. This is the new normal, almost like brave new world. Like, this is the world we live in. Um, and so she said it's interesting that since she's opened up about being assaulted, and um, this is in terms of her experience that happened in a locker room with transgender athletes, many leftist ad- activists told me it was made up. Democrats also told me it wasn't a big deal if I felt uncomfortable and I should get over it um, because this is a new reality. Um, so it's interesting. The testimonies yesterday were incredibly powerful from female athletes who were um, speaking about female sports should be for biological females only. That's why they were created. It's this safe space for them to be able to perform. Um, And it's interesting how quickly um, the left almost says, well, we've not gone far enough. We honestly, it's some of the left were the people who pushed for Title IX, for the people who pushed for all these, like, you know, it used to be like the old wave of feminism that pushed for all this. And now you're seeing it absolutely deteriorate in front of you where they won't even stand up and say, oh, yeah, you should be able to just play sports with women. Yeah, and this is this exactly points to the problem with politics <laughs> because, yeah, that wishy-washiness and what it makes me think of, it's a little off topic, but the same thing here um, as far as, uh, you know, sexual assault survivors and listening to women, which was obviously 
hugely pushed by the left, listening to anything that came out of a woman's mouth, no matter what, because she was a woman. Obviously, that's a problematic standpoint. But another story that's been circulating this week um, and last week as well and throughout the Israel-Hamas war is the fact that the U.N. women has not like hadn't made a statement at all about the rape and horrific atrocities committed against women, about rape being used uh, as a weapon of war by Hamas terrorists. So there's been a lot in the news about that as well, where all of the sudden um, Jewish women were not getting the same treatment as or reaction to the horrific things that they were experiencing as um, other women were, uh, and, and obviously throughout the left's history of stances were. And there were, you know, testimonies given yesterday also, um, so it'll be a few days ago today that I can't even, I can't even explain on this podcast some of the testimonies that were given in detail about what actually happened to the women on October 7th. It's absolutely horrific. I'd encourage you to look it up uh, and know that in that sense, it's you'll never be able to like unread or unsee or unknow the, th- the, some, the things from some of the testimonies people gave. But the point being, it's important to understand how serious and horrific um, everything is with this war um, and what Hamas did. So there's that. But again, it's like now all of a sudden with these Jewish women, there hasn't been that response for rape. So the, just looking at how has politics influenced things with morality and without morality, I guess, mm-hmm. well, is the point. And we saw so these two hearings going on at the same time, both of them bringing up really important things about protecting women. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see the left just stand and say, you know, we're not going to have that conversation. We We don't really honestly start to feel like the left doesn't care about women um the idea of we can't even define what a woman is anymore um it honestly you know unfortunately it seems to be going further and further like this is the time when we need to stand up um like these brave women female athletes have and say you know like in order so that so that my future children future if i have daughters can play sports like we have to advocate now we have to listen about what's going on like to see a world um organization the un say this you know it starts to become um we're at a dangerous time where um you can't start redefining everything you can't start redefining women and i'm grateful for the organization's um independent women's forum was there yesterday a lot of women for america yep and concerned women for america which um we have recorded for over this break um, an exciting interview with Penny Nance, the CEO of Concerned Women for America. Yeah, Katie did a wonderful job, Thank and you'll you. all want to be looking out for it. I think it'll come out in about two weeks, but that'll be a highlight interview that you're going to want to watch. Yes, and they've been doing, they've been on Capitol Hill uh, doing a lot of work to protect women's sports. So there are people Since out there the working. Since the beginning. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, you know, we got to be in the fight. Yeah, absolutely. And all sorts of things, connecting athletes uh, with the with their voices, giving them a platform to share their stories. So they've been great. Um, We have to wrap up. But I mean, just looking over all of this, it would be so great if we could all unite around what is right, good and true. Um, And that should obviously be the goal to strive for. And I hope that a sense of that can come back and that we can all unify around things that are right, good and true. So, Katie, And I are so happy that you joined us today and we're excited to see you next week. And then the following week with Katie's interview with Penny coming out, um, you're not going to want to miss it. So thank you for joining us and be sure to like and subscribe wherever you're watching to stay up to date with the latest. For more information on the Institute for Faith and Freedom, visit faithandfreedom.com.